Okay, good morning everybody. To some of you, good morning again. So Jenna's here, morning Jenna, morning Adelbert. Uh, Cindy's here, good morning Cindy. Uh, good, good evening Ella. Uh, hi Faye and Casey and Karen and Lily and Ying. Good morning to all of you. Um, hope everyone's doing okay out there. If you're in Vancouver, you can probably see it's getting nice and sunny now, which is much better. I think I, I missed the sun the last few the last few days. Uh, Aliana, good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, Lim is here too. Good morning. Um, and Min is here. Hello. Hello. Carmen's here. Hi, Carmen. So, um, what are we going to do today? Today we're going to kind of finish up talking about this um, human evolution stuff for the most part. Um, Again, it's kind of dangerous for me because I, I want to talk more about it, but we can't do it. We don't have time, so um, I'll just try and deal with it uh, very lightly, and then we'll we'll move on. Um, I'm just going to wait maybe another minute, and we'll see if we can get a few more people in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, pretty much everyone said hello um oh while while we're talking or while we're here um i did want to ask you i did want to ask you what you thought about reading the textbook and so maybe you could give me very quickly a feeling of how easy the textbook was to read so uh maybe one being uh, super difficult and you didn't understand anything all the way to 10 where it was totally easy to read no problem so what, what did you think in terms of reading the text was it on a 1 out of 10 was it super easy or super difficult or somewhere in between so 1 is really difficult and 10 is really easy um, how was it reading that Oh, Mashid's here too. Good morning, Mashid and Thisa. Good morning. Cindy says, okay, eight, seven, eight, seven, eight. Okay. That's pretty good. Seven. Yeah, that's good. That's good news. That's what I was hoping for. Um, you know, it is <clears throat> yeah, it's 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 complicated stuff. So it it shouldn't be it shouldn't be super easy, but I'm glad it's not um Glad it's not super difficult as well. Um, okay, lots of sevens and eights. That's good. That's good news. That's what I'm looking for. Um, okay, so let's. Carmen's got seven. Okay, that's good. Let's dive into. Let's dive into where we were yesterday. Okay. So yesterday, if you remember, we were talking a little bit about anthropological theory, and we said that. Um, if you're going to try to understand anything in science, you need some kind of theoretical framework. You have to have some sort of approach that you're going to use to interpret what you see. And we said that <clears throat> physics and biology and chemistry, all of those have theoretical models that are that they use in order to understand the world, right? And so we said that if you took chemistry, there is a model of a model of the atom and atoms don't really look that way in real life but the model helps us to understand how atoms work and to predict how they'll behave right and so uh, anthropology has theoretical frameworks as well they have approaches to how we understand culture and so we looked at a few of those yesterday um, we looked through social evolution we said that we don't really use social evolution anymore um, but it was kind of the first anthropological theory that um, was developed. And again, it <clears throat> tried to, uh, good morning, Michael, no problem. Um, social evolution tried to answer the question or, yeah, tried to answer the question of why are cultures different? Why are societies different? Why are, why do, why are some very complicated and use all sorts of complicated technology? And why are some kind of more simple um, technologically and organizationally? And so, 
social evolutionists, kind of in the late 1800s, they argued that all societies kind of pass through these phases of savagery and barbarism and then eventually civilization. And they said that really conflict and warfare was what moved societies along. Good morning, Sam. Conflict is, was what moved societies forward. And so the more conflict and warfare that a society had, the more developed and advanced it would be until eventually it reached the level of civilization. Um, so the theory kind of assumed that everyone was on, every culture was on the same path. It was on the same road towards civilization and a civilization that looked like uh, Western Europe civilization. Um, and it also assumed that Western, civil, Western European civilization was the peak, the pinnacle. It was what all cultures were moving towards. Um, but as time went on, anthropologists started to identify that some of those ideas were false, right? Not every culture was on the same kind of path of evolution. Not every culture was destined to become what Western European civilization had become. Um, and there was a lot of racist views baked into this, um, into this theory, the idea that Western civilization was better than all of the others and all of the other cultures were kind of trying to get there. Um, and that's just not quite true. It's, it's not really true at all, actually. Um, so social evolution was eventually kind of discarded as a, a theory. They kind of threw it out. We talked a little bit yesterday about historical particularism, which came a little bit after. And historical particularism was the idea that each culture had its own history. Each culture was on its own sort of path of development. So instead of everybody going through these predictable stages on the way to civilization, every culture was kind of evolving on its own based on the events that happened to it. Um, and so historical particularism is still um, an approach that we think about today in anthropology. And again, it was one that managed to um, put an end to racist theories in anthropology, which was, um, which was beneficial as well. We talked a little bit about functionalism, the idea that different parts of a culture work together to support the whole, just like parts of a car or organs of the human body. Um, and we talked a, a little bit about a functionalist approach to the Kapuku society with their exchange of pigs and their marriage customs and warfare and things like that. That was kind of a functionalist approach. We talked a little bit about cultural ecology yesterday, the idea that um, you could think about a culture kind of like an animal in the environment and that animal has to adapt to environmental change in order to survive and so cultural ecologists look at a culture within its environment and try to understand what cultures need to do in order to survive in their particular environment so whether they live in the arctic or a jungle or a desert or a coast or whatever um, so the environment here plays a very strong role in how anthropologists understand culture. We talked a little bit about structural anthropology. So the idea that cultures try to help human beings find kind of a happy middle ground between two extremes. And so whatever kind of extremes you want to talk about, whether it's life and death or good and bad or... Um, light and dark or the world of the divine, the world of the sacred and the world of humans. Um, however you want to think about those two kind of extremes, um, structural anthropology helps humans to find sort of a, a nice middle ground to work in. And so we talked about this yesterday in terms of lying, right? Most, most of us would agree that truth is good and lies are bad. But there are some instances in which telling the truth is maybe not the best thing, right? And then there are other situations where lying is not the best thing. And so our culture helps, to, helps us to find our way through and to 
figure out how we should behave kind of in the middle because we don't want to behave in extreme ways. We talked about symbolic and interpretive anthropology. So the idea that cultures are made up of symbols uh, and those symbols communicate meaning to people. And that was very reflective of us talking about the chess game or the football game. We were interpreting those things symbolically, right? Um, and lastly, we talked a little bit about postmodernism. And again, that's something that we may not deal with too much in this, in this course here, but that was the idea that there really is no absolute knowledge. Um, really, the thing that you're studying depends on who's studying it. And the version of reality that we accept is connected to who has power in a society. And that's something that uh, postmodernism is something that will affect our social justice class more than this one. Um, but I just thought I would mention it uh, anyway. Okay. Now that brought us to prehistory. And so really what we're talking about here is pre-written history. Um, because again, we'll, we'll get to this very shortly, but writing is something that humans develop fairly late, right? Um, us, Homo sapiens, we're about 300,000 years old, but we only develop writing, we've only developed writing in the last five or 6,000 years. So there's 295,000 years of our history for which there's no writing. We don't know what people were thinking or, or doing because nothing is written down. And so all of our knowledge about this period, this almost, almost all of our history as humans, um, is discovered through archeological remains. And so the sort of garbage that people leave behind, their physical remains, their, their bones that they've left behind, and any tools and things that we can find as well. So archeology span is what's kind of painting the picture um, archaeology and genetics, I should say, too, are painting the picture of what life was like for our species for really most of our history, um, because people only start writing things down in the last 5,000 years. And so for the almost 300,000 years before that, there's no writing. And so we have to sort of piece things together um, using archaeology. Um, one of the questions that we were trying to ask here was, where does culture come from? Because no other, no other animal has culture, right? No, no other animal passes down its um, beliefs and values and behaviors quite like humans do. And so that led us to look at our family tree, our hominid family tree. And I said that there's, there's no clear picture of what this looks like because piecing together our history as a species over hundreds of thousands of years um, is a very difficult process. Um, some anthropologists have imagined it to, um, some anthropologists have imagined it to be, or they've, they've made an analogy like, you've all made puzzles, right? You have a puzzle and there's a bunch of pieces and you put them together. Um, some anthropologists have made the comparison that when you're trying to put together the picture of what our evolutionary history looks like, it's almost like putting together a puzzle, but you don't have all of the pieces. You only have some of the pieces. Some of the pieces are broken and you don't have the top of the box. So you don't really know what the picture is supposed to be that you're putting together. Um, and so for this reason, it's, it's an, it's an ever-changing story. And so every time we find more evidence, the story of our evolutionary history kind of, kind of switches a little bit, kind of changes. Um, but that's okay. That's how science is supposed to work. Um, I showed you this. This is a bit of a family tree in terms of our evolutionary history. And you can see Homo sapiens there at the end in blue. That's us. Um, again, we're, hey, Jimmy. Um, um, we're, we're a very recent species, but lots of bipedal hominids, so primates that walked on two feet, um, have come before us, and, and we're sort of a, a, just a much more recent version of them. Um, 
Karen, you've mentioned here, um, what about crows and hating people? Yeah, there's some really interesting um, science that has demonstrated that crows somehow manage to pass on some knowledge to their offspring. Um, I forget, there's an American college professor that's done some work on this, and uh, it's really interesting. And um, <clears throat> crows are quite a bit smarter than most people think they are. And so um, you're absolutely right, Karen. They have... Um, they have managed to demonstrate that crows are able to transmit some knowledge to their offspring. Um, of course, not nearly to the degree that humans do, um, but you're right. Some animals are able to teach things to their teach things to their children in some way. Um, yeah, but you're you're definitely right, and it's really cool. It's a really cool. Um, uh, it's a really cool kind of discovery that, that crows do this. Um, so we have this kind of very long history of bipedal hominids running around. And some of the first bipedal hominids probably look something like this. And so actually, I'll just go back. This is an Artipithecus ramidus. And so you can see Artipithecus in the orange um, on the diagram there. And Artipithecus is showing up maybe around five and a half million years ago to four and a half million years ago, it might be the first bipedal primate. It might not. We're not entirely sure. Um, but the first bipedal primates probably look something like this. And so I'm sure when you're looking at this picture, you think, well, it's not entirely human looking, right? If you look at its face, it has a very ape-like face, right? It looks kind of more like a chimpanzee or a gorilla than it looks like a human. Um, if you look at the body proportions, you'll see something that's quite a bit different from humans, right? This, um, this creature has kind of a long body, right? Like a long torso, and its legs are kind of shorter. Um, mostly with humans, you see longer legs and a shorter body. Um, and look at those arms too, right? Those are really long arms. Um, if you're swinging around in the trees, then long arms are great. Long arms are really helpful. Um, not so much walking around on two feet, but again, this is a very early version. This is very early evolution of a primate that walks on two feet. And so they still have really long arms, um, big hands to help them swing through the trees. Um, and if you look at their feet, you'll see very strange looking feet, uh, feet that don't look like humans at all. Um, you'll see that their big toe is able to grab onto branches, um, just like some, uh, some primates that still exist. So if this is not the first primate to walk on two feet, um, it's a very early form of it. And you can see there's a bit of a mix of characteristics here that would help this animal move around in the trees very easily, but also uh, an animal that can walk on two feet on the ground. Um, here's a bit of a later version of what these animals might have looked like. Um, these are Australopithecus afarensis, and so you'll see them if I go back a couple slides. Oops. Uh, you'll see Australopithecus afarensis in green, kind of in the middle of the, the picture. And so they're kind of around from four to three million years ago. Um, and you can see again, they're not entirely human-like, right? They, they, they do look like apes that are walking on two feet. Um, they've had some more evolution. They're better at walking on two feet than Artipithecus was, um, but still kind of very early versions of bipedal primates um, and not particularly intelligent ones either, um, at least as compared to us. And so there's lots of different um, species that existed in the past. Some of them, like I said, some of them might be our relatives. They might be our ancestors. Some of them, not so much. Uh, but we're still piecing together what this history wa was like. Um, but again, it's, I kind of like looking at these faces. It's interesting to, it's interesting to imagine a world where, you know, these kind of, strange creatures are running around on two feet and um, kind of living living their lives with with no 
humans like us around. So yesterday I pointed out this one particular hominid, um, Homo habilis, as being particularly important to the study of human culture. And the reason I kind of singled out this, this particular hominid was A, that it was the first member of our genus, so it's the first of the genus Homo, but I also pointed out because of the tools that it made. And so here's a picture of these stone tools that um, Homo habilis made. Uh, I mentioned them yesterday and as you can see, they are not super impressive, right? They are very, very simple tools, um, but they're critically important to our evolution nonetheless, right? I explained that probably what these animals were doing was using them to obtain food from the kills of other animals. And so if you imagine, um, if you imagine an animal that's killed uh, kind of on the African savanna, so maybe lions or a leopard have killed a, a zebra or a wildebeest, when the lions or the leopards are done, there's not really that much left, right? You can see this poor, uh, this poor jackal or this poor dog-like creature he looks a little sad, right? He looks like there's not much left for him to eat. And the same thing for a homo habilis. There won't be much meat left to eat here either, but homo habilis has this little tool, right? And if he comes along with this little tool, he can break open some of these bones and get at the marrow. He can break open the skull and get at the brains, which this animal can't do. Um, and so they have a new food source. Um, it's also interesting to think that this new food source that they had, access to the brains of these animals, um, those brains have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in them. And if you know anything about your nutrition, you'll know that omega-3s are good for your brain. And they're good for your brain because your brain is partially built with them. Uh, and so it's interesting to think that these animals had, these homo habiluses had access to um, a source of omega-3s that is actually good, really good for your brain, right? Um, but even more important, the reason I bring these guys up is that the tools are evidence of repeated, patterned, transmitted behavior, okay? And this is what culture is, right? Culture is behaviors that are patterned and that are passed down from generation to generation. And homo habilis here, is the first evidence we have for that sort of behavior, the fact that they are passing down knowledge from one generation to another. Um, so he's pretty, he's pretty important in our, um, in our evolutionary story. And here's a kind of a museum piece here where they're imagining what Homo habiluses might have been like uh, millions of years ago. Okay. So I said during the process of our human evolution, a few things happen. So number one, we start walking on two feet, right? If you go back earlier than five or six million years ago, you'll see most of our ancestors running around on four feet. But walking on two feet has been incredibly important for us because we can now use our hands to do things, particularly to make tools. Um, our brains, of course, are very different from most animals on the planet uh, in the way that they're wired and in the way that they're structured. There's a lot of similarities, um, but there are also some important differences that give us the ability to do things with our brain that most animals can't. Um, I mentioned that humans have evolved a strong attachment system, and so we tend to attach to other people and to our parents, and that helps us to cooperate and care for each other and empathize for each other. Um, that's been incredibly important to humans in their history. Um, oh yeah, and I had that last point too that I couldn't remember. Couldn't remember what I was talking about. So I'm just gonna skip by it. Um, all right, so I asked you to read this short section of the textbook and then I asked you to um, answer the questions based on the text. Now, this was probably a little bit tricky. And number one, because 
human evolution is complicated. There's a lot of terms in there that might have been difficult. Um, and what you read in the textbook is really just scratching the surface. Um, when I was in university, I took an entire university class just on hominid, hominid evolution. So the, the entire class was on what you read about in eight or nine pages. And so you're really just getting kind of the surface layer of this. But sometimes, you know, if you don't dig deep enough into something, it's harder to understand. Um, but we'll we'll give it a whirl and we'll see. We'll see how we did. OK, so maybe what I'll ask you to do is we'll we'll go to the first question here and maybe you can copy and paste your answers into the live chat and then we can deal with them. So the first one is what were some of the factors that led to hominid bipedalism? So why do why do our ancestors start walking on two feet in the first place what do they what do they say in the textbook what did you um what did you what did you find in reading the text So Cindy says, Cindy says they uh, require to apply their skills um, to craft and use tools and how they survived and how they grew to improve. Okay, so that is true, right? The ability to, once these animals started walking on two feet and they didn't have to use their front feet to walk around, um, it's true. They were able to do things with their hands that other animals couldn't, right? And so eventually that will give them the ability to to make tools um, and so we never would have been able to make the tools that we've made if we were still walking around on on four feet right so that's very true um, what else what else do you have uh, Michael says Michael says it can make them easier to get food because they have tools. Um, yeah, in some cases that's true, right? The the ability to use a tool can allow these animals to access new sources of food. Um, but keep in mind that there's a long time between when these animals start to walk on two feet and when they develop tools. There might be about two million years between the first primates walking on two feet and the first primates that use tools. And so that's a long time. Um, one is here, that's no problem. Hmm. Let's see maybe what else we have. This is a tricky question. This is a tricky question for sure. Um, Karen says there were changes in the ah uh, there were changes in the environment where they were staying, yeah. And this was an earlier version of why anthropologists thought that um, primates started walking on two feet to begin with. And so around that time, there's some climate changes, and as you probably read, there's lots of climate changes throughout um, our history that because things became warmer and drier. Um, Places that were used to be jungles, kind of the jungle shrank and became open grassland. And so it was more helpful for animals that could walk on two feet, right? They could see further, they could see predators. And walking on two feet is a lot more efficient than walking on four. Um, um, Aliana, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So I'm just going to leave that for a minute. Um, so it's true we have it's actually a confusing picture and we don't this is the question that we don't really know the answer to yet um, so in a way it's a little bit unfair of them to ask you but um, we do know that there are bipedal primates from 
four or five million years ago, some of which are living in forests, some of which are living on open grassland. Um, the ones with certain features like angled knee joints and arched feet uh, might have been better suited to walking long distances out in the grassland. But in all honesty, we don't quite know the answer to this question. We don't know why it was useful for the first primates to stand on two feet. It's still a bit of a mystery. Um, it must have been useful because really the only things that evolve and stay around in terms of evolution are things that are useful to the animal. And so it must have been useful for primates five or six million years ago to start to walk on two feet. But we're not really sure, we're not really sure why it was useful to them. Um, that's still that's still a piece of the puzzle that we're trying to figure out. Um, number two, how did how did cl climate affect hominid development? What did you say for that? And so this isn't a question of when humans start or when hominids start walking on two feet. This is more of a question of once there were already bipedal primates, how did how did the climate um, influence them? Man, this is a tough question too. There's nothing but tough questions this morning for you guys. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So Cindy says they began to use fire and hunting because of the change in climate, right? The earth began to freeze. So some of them traveled to warmer environments like the savanna. Yeah, so a couple things happen here. Um, yes, at some point our ancestors learned to create fire and to manage fire. And so that can keep them warm in cold climates. That can allow them to cook food, which is important. Um, and it encourages migration, right? Some, um, some of our ancestors might have moved to warmer climates because people like it when it's, when it's warm, right? Um, yeah, so those, Cindy, those are all good. Um, Mashid says climate change forced many bipedal hominids to migrate into and beyond new areas in Africa. Yeah, so when climates change, environments change, the availability of food changes, and so sometimes that can um, influence animals to move, right? They can move to places where they're more comfortable or where their food source has moved to, right? Um, Casey says, because of the change in climate, many hominids migrated to Australia and to America, uh, but those who remained became more strong and powerful in order to fight and stay in cold in the cold climate. Yes, that's true as well, and I have um, a slide or two to show you on that, Casey. Um, Michael says climate change uh, made them harder to live and get food. Yeah, in some cases, um, particularly when the earth gets cold, right? Areas freeze over, plants die, um, certain animals die off as well. And so in colder environments, sometimes it becomes more difficult to survive. And some of our ancestors had to adapt to that. And again, I've got a slide on that in a minute. But she says uh, the world cooled, producing more fractured environments. Uh, some hominids may have remained in the woods, but those who left the forest began to flourish in the grasslands. Yeah, so climate change. Uh, and Michael also says less places to live and easier to, yeah. So I think we've got all of this. As environments change, as things, places get warmer or cooler, um, certain animals appear or certain animals die off or plants die off. It changes how easy it is to live in a particular place. And so sometimes it causes some of our ancestors to move and to colonize new areas. Um, let me just check here. Okay. Now, is that really, what did you say for question number three? How did, how and why did Homo sapiens expand out of Africa? Because we do, the evidence that we have suggests that our species um, probably evolved in Eastern Africa somewhere, and then eventually left Africa and began to spread throughout the rest of the world. But why do you think they, why do you think they leave? Is, is climate part of that as well? Oops. Um, sorry, Thisa, I'm gonna add yours in here too. I think this is from the last question that climate change affects the development of hominids, their body, their appearance, and their internal organs. 
Yes, I'll show you a slide on that in just a second. Uh, and Adalbert says, um, yeah, there were changes in vegetation. That's true. So as the climate gets warmer or cooler or wetter or drier, certain plants are going to disappear and certain plants are going to appear, right? And so that's going to change the environment for our hominid friends and they might move from, from one place to another. Um, so what did you say about why they left Africa? What did you, what did you say for that one? What did you say for that one? Why, why did our ancestors, our human ancestors, why did they leave? Why did they leave Africa? Or have we answered that one already? Let me, oops, let me see what I, what I had for that one, okay? Oh, hang on. Um, Casey says, Homo sapiens moved out of Africa to escape the change of climate and also because they were becoming more advanced than other hominids. Um, th that's true, right? We were, um, when we appeared, when us, Homo sapiens appear, we're not the only hominids that are around. There are a number of other species that in some ways we're in competition with and it might it might have made it easier for us to leave africa and go other places where there weren't any hominids and then we wouldn't have to compete with anyone right we'd be all on our own um Mashid says uh oh yeah okay so Mashid says that too because they're more developed than other hominids homo sapiens were capable of adapting to changes in the environment they could coordinate um, and live in any atmosphere. Yeah, that's good too. Um, Homo sapiens began to be better at better at adapting to new environments, and so maybe it was more attractive for them to um, to move into other situations. It was easier for them to adapt to changing environments. And Thesa, you said kind of the same thing here, that Homo sapiens are more advanced than other species and they're better equipped um, with stone equipment for hunting. Yeah, that's true too. If you have better technology, then you might be able to move into other places in the world and succeed where other hominids might fail. Um, yeah, and Michael says it could be a situation of too much, too many people and not enough resources right it could be that as well and so maybe Africa was getting a little bit crowded and because we were so technologically advanced and adaptable we decided to leave Africa and move to other areas um, and last question how and when did homo sapiens populate the Americas and so when do when do humans come to North and South America When do humans come to North and South America? Oh, I miss Cindy there as well, sorry. Um, Cindy says here that they, oh, okay. So yeah, they, they populated the Americas probably around 12,000 years ago, and they are considered to have populated from Beringia. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, around 12,000 years ago, which is shockingly, um, which is shockingly late, right? Um, our ancestors were living and evolving in Africa from about 300,000 years ago. And yet people only appear in North and South America starting around, yeah, 12 to 15,000 years ago. Um, yeah, which is, which is pretty crazy, right? Um, let me show you some slides here that are connected to some of these questions. Oh, hang on. Here we go. So this is a little map, a little global map that shows some of the evidence we have for us, um, Homo sapiens, but also some other, um, some other species as well 
leaving Africa and migrating to other places in the world. And so you can see here that um, we're going to look at the red. Uh, the yellow is a different species. That's Homo erectus, but we'll leave Homo erectus alone for now. Um, if you look at the red, you'll see that us humans start to move out of uh, move out of Africa. You can see some some uh, Homo sapien sites around a hundred thousand years ago in Israel, in what's modern Israel today. Um, you can see us up in what's now the Czech Republic around thirty three thousand years ago. Um, kind of in central Russia about 15,000 years ago. Um, we can see some Homo sapiens moving into China around 67,000 years ago. So you can see us kind of moving out of Africa and slowly kind of colonizing the entire world. Um, we only make it into North America around 12 or 15,000 years ago because prior to that, you can see that there was an ice age and this um, entire top part of North America was covered in ice and so us humans could leave Africa and we could move all the way through Asia and into sort of northeastern Russia but there was really no way into North America it was you would just encounter a wall of ice um, and so that doesn't really change until 15, 14, 13,000 years ago when um, when the ice starts to melt, when the global uh, global climate warms up a little bit. And so there's this little period around, let's say, 15 or 14,000 years ago where the ice has started to melt and disappear, but because so much is still frozen, the sea levels are lower, right? There's a lot of water that's tied up in ice. And so at that time in history, you can actually walk across from Northeast Russia right into what's now Alaska. Um, obviously today, those they're separated by the Bering Strait, which you can see there. But at the time, those were connected land areas and you could just walk right across. And so people start to do that. They start to walk right across and um, the ancestors of all of our First Nations people today, um, this, is, this is when they came into North and South America. Um, the ancestors of the Aztecs, who we talked about a couple days ago, they entered this same way, we think. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to bring up this species as well for a couple reasons. Um, these are Homo, this is Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals as they're kind of commonly called. Um, they're important because they are our closest relative. Um, obviously, they are not alive anymore. They are extinct, um, but they are the most similar to us um, for, in anything that's ever lived. So chimpanzees, for, for instance, they share about 98% of their DNA with us. These guys share almost all of their DNA with us. They're very, very genetically similar to us. But as you can see, they're also very different as well. Um, these are the kind of human ancestors that uh, their bodies kind of change to, uh, to adapt to the cold. That's what you were reading about. Um, and so you can see here in a quick comparison of a human skull, a Homo sapiens skull on the left, and a Neanderthal skull on the right, you can see that these are really different looking creatures. Um, and what you would notice about them in if you looked at if you looked at a Neanderthal, you would notice that they're really kind of big and heavily built, okay? So big bones, big muscles, big heads. Um, they're kind of a very distinctive looking version of a human. So not very similar to us, at least genetically speaking, but also very different to look at. And so if you, <laughs> if you dressed one up in a suit, um, yeah, he looks human, but also there's something very different about this guy, right? There's something very diff different about the way he looks, and that's because he's a different species of human, um, and a species of human that we shared the planet with up until maybe 40 or even 30,000 years ago. Um, we were in coexistence with these creatures. Um, 
which is kind of interesting to think about, right? It's kind of interesting to think about what a world would be like with another species of human, humans that are kind of like us, but also kind of not, right? They're kind of very different looking. Um, that would be kind of a strange world to live in, I think. Um, so yeah, we talked about how um, Homo sapiens expanded out of Africa. It could have to do with our technological advancement. It could have to do with changes in climate. It could have to do with competition with other hominids. All of those things could have um, could have played into it. Now, the last thing I want to tell you is some or about not the last thing, but something else I want to talk to you about is the cognitive revolution. But I think um, we're at about 1050 right now. Maybe it's a good time to take a break. Uh, and then when we come back, I'll talk a little more about the cognitive revolution. Okay, so let's take a little break and I'll see you back here in in 10. Okay.
Okay, people, we're back. So, so far we've talked a little bit about how humans evolved. And again, we start out, or our ancestors start out five or six million years ago, kind of as bipedal apes. So basically apes that are walking on two feet. But over the course of five or six million years, um, a lot changes in terms of our body structure, in terms of our feet, in terms of our ability to walk on two feet, but also in our ability to make and use tools to transmit culture and learning from generation to generation, uh, in the development of our brains and what our brains are capable of, um, to eventually kind of lead us to the type of animal that we are today. And so it's Honestly, it's too bad we can't dig into it because it's quite a story that takes us from, you know, an, an ape who stands on two feet all the way to an ape that can go into space and can go to the moon, right? That's a, that's a massive change, even in five million years, which is seems like a long time. It's a huge change for a certain type of animal to undergo. Um, and so one of the things that kind of makes this possible actually i'll just go back one of the things that make this makes this possible is something that anthropologists call the cognitive revolution so when we first evolve in africa as homo sapiens um, i want you to imagine kind of an animal that's mostly like us okay so we're um you know if you saw one you would notice them as human you would think that yes they're one of us um, but in terms of their intelligence and their um, kind of brain power if you will they still weren't quite as intelligent as we are okay they were certainly more intelligent than probably any other thing on the planet at the time but not nearly as intelligent as we currently are and what seems to have happened um, around 70,000 years ago is that we start to see evidence of a different kind different kind of thought, okay? Different type of intellectual activity. Um, we start to see much more complicated tools and we start to see the first art. And so if you ever take an art history course, you will see this Lion Man statue. Um, Actually, I should have looked this up. I'm not sure of the Lion Man's age. Um, I think he dates to about 50,000 years ago or so. Um, but he's pretty notable. Um, if you look at him as a, just as, as, a, as, a, as an object, as an archaeological object, um, he's interesting because he doesn't have any obvious use. Right. He's, he's not a tool. Right. He's not a, a blade or a spear point or anything like that. Um, he's just a, a statue. He's just a thing. He doesn't really have a use as far as we know. And second of all, he's very interesting because he's imaginary. Right. There are no lion men walking around. There are no humans with lion heads. Um, and so this is evidence that these humans imagined something, right? They imagined something that didn't exist before. So this isn't the sculpture of a lion and it's not the sculpture of a human. It's the sculpture of something in between, something imaginary. And that's a different level of cognitive ability, right? That's a different, um, that's a different kind of intellectual capacity in order to imagine things that don't exist. Uh, and of course, that's something that's very important to us today. We're constantly imagining things that don't exist. That's an important um, aspect of what humans are. Um, we see lots of cave paintings like you find in, um, uh, there's a number of caves in France and Spain, Lascaux and Altamira and a few others, and phenomenal amounts of art are found on the walls and they kind of look like this. And there's lots of kind of hunting scenes and animal scenes. You can see here, um, not a domestic cow, but the probably the ancestor of domestic cows, a wild cow or an oryx. Um, 
a wild horse you can see there. Um, in some cases you see handprints and so people have put their hand on the cave wall and then spread paint around it so you can still see their handprint on the wall. It's pretty amazing. You also see very complicated sets of tools and so these are all made of stone. They're blade tools and if you can see by the scale at the bottom of the screen, um, they're actually really small. Some of these little blades are a little more than a centimeter long. Um, again, they're made out of stone and they're really difficult to make. Um, you might look at stone tools and think, well, big deal, they're really primitive and they're just made of stone. But being able to do this is very, very difficult. Um, I took a stone tools class at university and we learned all about stone tools and one day we went down into the lab and we got our hands on some of this stone that um, humans might have used. And so we got the stone and we put our gloves on and our goggles on and we tried to make some stone tools. And after about an hour, I made something that was sort of a triangle, kind of. Um, but the, the kind of things that our ancestors are making here, um, the skill level to make these types of tools is ridiculous, okay? They're very difficult to make. And so um, around 70,000 years ago, we start to see really complicated tools like this. Um, here's some fish hooks that people have carved from bone or from ivory or from wood. And of course, they've woven the, the string that they need, the, the line, the fishing line that they need. Here's a number of different types of tools. Um, you make these by grinding stone, and so these are axes or um, wood shaping tools here that are made of um, a few different materials, either bone or antler, um, and then also with stone added into them. Uh, here's a few more ground axe heads. And so really complicated technology. And so what anthropologists imagined happened around this time is that there were a few mutations in our DNA that changed the way our brains were wired. And specifically, it resulted in more interconnections between the neurons in our brains. And that was really what kind of bumped us up in terms of intelligent, uh, intelligence level. That made us more intelligent than Neanderthals and really significantly more intelligent than really any other creature had ever been. Um, and so that seems to happen, or we, we suspect that happened around 70,000 years ago. And from that time on, so from 70,000 years onward, you can basically imagine humans to be exactly like us, okay? Um, they didn't have all the technology that we have today, of course, but they were identical to you and me. They had the same kind of thoughts and feelings and emotions. Um, they, were, they were us just living in a world 70,000 years ago. Um, now, we think that this type of brain was very useful to us because of the way that it could store social information. Okay? And we talked about that a little bit when we talked about the idea of humans being really good at co uh, cooperating in a flexible way and cooperating in large numbers. So if you imagine, for instance, if you live in a group of 50 individuals, okay, you have 50 people in your group. If you think about every one-on-one -on -one relationship, okay, so everyone has a relationship with someone else, maybe they're friends, maybe they're enemies, maybe they're husband and wife, who knows, but everyone has a relationship with everyone else in the group. That's over 1,200 relationships that you need to kind of keep track of, right? That you, if you're going to sort of cooperate and live with this group, you have to know who gets along with each other and who doesn't, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is the type of social information that other animals aren't really good at keeping track of. And so animals that cooperate flexibly, like wolves or killer whales, um, they can't keep track of that many individuals. It's too much. And so 
wolf packs, for instance, will often split up and become smaller if they if they get beyond 20 or 30 animals. But humans, as it turns out, have a brain that's very good at storing social information. We're very good at keeping track of relationships. We're very good at keeping track of people. Um, and so this might be one of the things that helps us to cooperate so well in large numbers is that our brains store social information very well and very easily. So again, after that happens, we are in a position to um, kind of outcompete every other hominid species that still exists. And so we start to leave, um, Homo sapiens starts to migrate out of Africa um, in a number of different times. They don't all leave at once, of course. Some Homo sapiens stay in Africa, some uh, migrate out of Africa. And like I mentioned, they continue to um, spread throughout the whole world, finally coming to North and South America in about 15 to 12,000 years ago. Um, oops, did I jump back somehow? Yeah, I did. Okay. Now, during this time, there are other hominid species still around. Um, there's Neanderthals, who we just met. They still exist. Um, there's Homo erectus, who we didn't talk about, talk about, but they still exist in various places. Um, there's Homo denisova, who we definitely didn't talk about, uh, but they still exist. And so this is a world where Homo sapiens are kind of moving out of Africa and spreading into the rest of the world, but some other hominid species actually already live there. And what happens over the next um, few tens of thousands of years is that all the other ones disappear. Okay, and eventually, as I'm sure you're aware, we'll be the only ones left. We'll be the only hominid species left on the planet. So there's basically two theories about how, about what happens to these other hominids. The first one is interbreeding. So the idea here is that Homo sapiens leaves Africa and they interbreed with other species that they encounter, okay? And over time, eventually, these two groups of animals become one and we're just left with us. We're just left with Homo sapiens. The other theory is that we replace them. And so we either are better at getting food and shelter than they are, and so we're more successful and we continue to multiply and they continue to disappear. Or we actually get into a, an outright conflict with these other um, with these other hominids and we kind of kill them off. Um, if you look at the evidence, it's not entirely clear what happens. Okay. Um, if you look at genetic evidence, you'll see that um, Homo sapiens share some genetic similarities with Neanderthals. We have some Neanderthal genes, genes in our DNA. Um, it's not clear if that's because we have interbred or if it's because we're just actually very closely related and we share some of the same DNA. That's not, that's not clear. Um, we don't have any evidence of outright conflict between hominids. So we don't have, in the archaeological record, we don't have, say, a Neanderthal skull with a Homo sapiens spearhead stuck in it. We don't have any, any evidence of that. So it's not entirely clear what has happened in the past. But whatever happened, one way or the other, we are the only ones left after about 30,000 years ago. Um, and again, we continue to be that. And so even though us being the only human species on the planet is completely normal for us in the modern world, um, it's not typical of history. For really all of our evolutionary history, there have been multiple species of bipedal hominid. And it's just kind of a strange <clears throat> circumstance that we're the only ones left today. Um, Okay, so throughout our evolution, this is kind of what happens. Um, we develop a number of adaptations in our brains. We develop the ability to run, which we didn't talk about and we won't, but we, we have adaptations for that too. And we use our tools to change our place in, in the food chain, right? And so 
when our ancestors start out they are very clearly in the middle of the food chain they get eaten by lions and leopards and the ancestors of those animals for millions of years um, but over time we manage to move ourselves to the top of the food chain right to the to become an apex predator like i mentioned we develop a very complicated brain which allows us to think complicated abstract thoughts uh, our brain allows us to create complicated language and it allows us to store a lot of social data so that we can cooperate with each other um, very effectively and maybe most importantly humans or hominids in general we we change we change from animals that use biological adaptations to respond to the environment to ones that use learned behavior to solve those same challenges so culture becomes our adaptation to the environment okay if you think of most animals um, if the environment changes tomorrow so if we all woke up tomorrow and Vancouver was covered in ice and snow and it stayed that way for years and years and years um, if that happened immediately tomorrow a lot of animals would die right a lot of animals that live here would die because they rely on their bodies they rely on their genetics in order to help them survive but <clears throat> genetics can't change that quickly right evolution takes generations and generations and generations to change but for us we use our learned behavior we don't have to wait for evolution to catch up to environmental change right and so if everything turns into an icy world tomorrow we can make fire right we can sew warmer clothing we can learn how to to behave in this new environment and learned behavior can change very very quickly your genes your genetics that takes a little longer right so humans are in a position to respond to all kinds of different changes because their adaptation is not biological it's not genetic it is learned it is cultural and cultures can change behavior can change really really quickly okay all right so how does that sound are we okay so far do you want to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a question mark or some other kind of emoji that expresses your feelings or emotions at this point how are we doing I know that there's a lot of information in there I know that it's complicated and I know that we don't really have time to <clears throat> deal with it in depth but are we are we okay are we okay all right so Cindy says okay Pearlie's good Casey's good Liana's good good that's um at the end I think yeah this is good Sam's good Adalbert Carmen good everyone's okay all right so again I know that that's a lot for it's a lot of information but hopefully it's enough to set us up um, okay the next thing I want to talk about and, and you'll you'll have seen the the card come up um, already is subsistence okay and subsistence is going to be something that we talk about that we'll come back to as we walk through different cultures everyone's okay okay good good thumbs up all right um, subsistence is something we'll come back to because subsistence has to do with the way that people get their food in a society okay how do you how do you obtain the things that you need to live particularly food okay and I think we could probably all intuitively understand that this is an important thing right because you know values and beliefs and that, all that stuff is important but people have to eat food right as a as a biological organism we all need to eat food and so and that's kind of where we'll start looking at culture is looking at how people interact with the environment and how they get the food that they need in order to survive right because 
you can't have culture if everyone starves. And so this is kind of where we will start. And so this is a bit of a fancy anthropological term, but we'll be calling these things subsistence patterns or subsistence strategies. And like I mentioned, this is the way in which Ying is good too. Okay, awesome. Um, this is the, the way in which a group, a cultural group, acquires and processes and stores its food. And so obviously it's very closely connected to the environment, right? The environment around you will, to some degree, dictate how you get your food, okay? And I think, again, I think we could all sort of intuitively think about that. Um, and again, we'll start out with, we'll start out talking about subsistence as just a kind of a cultural universal because that kind of sets the, the basis, it sets the foundation for all the other parts of culture, right? People have to interact with their environment and people have to eat before anything else. Um, and so all the other pieces of culture that we might talk about, like religion or how people get married to each other or the division of labor, right? Whose job, um, who does what kind of job in society enculturation and socialization, politics, economics, all of these things start out with the environment you live in and how you get your food, right? And again, this is a, this is a cultural ecology kind of, um, kind of approach, right? That we talked about a little bit earlier. There's basically five ways of a society getting their food, okay? Um, you may have heard of some of these already and you may not. Um, we won't talk about all of them, but I think in the in this course, we will manage to talk about most of them, okay? Now, the first one is hunting and gathering or foraging. Um, that's where people hunt animals or fish for animals, uh, fish for fish, um, or they gather things from the natural environment. So foragers don't keep any domestic animals, so they don't have pigs or chickens or anything like that. Um, and foragers don't grow any of their own food, so they don't do any farming, okay? They just gather what nature provides. Um, the second one is horticulture or Swidden agriculture. Um, that's where people grow their own food, but kind of in a very simple manner. And so you can imagine maybe a little farming village where everyone has land behind their house and they sort of grow their own food and that's that's kind of how they they eat okay so it's very very simple very very simple agriculture um, third there's pastoralism so this is where people domesticate animals um, sometimes people exclusively use pastoralism to meet their needs and so some people like in Siberia they have herds of reindeer and the reindeer basically provide them with almost everything they need to survive. Um, some people mix pastoralism with farming. And so you might be growing your own food, but you also might have pigs or chickens or goats or cows um, that you have domesticated and you, um, and you eat them from time to time, right? The fourth one is intensive agriculture. So this is where people have really, really big farms uh, and they use technology like plows or fertilizers or pesticides um, in order to farm one piece of land for a long time. And so this, this generally goes along with more complicated cultures um, with civilizations, which we'll talk about. Um, and then the last one is probably the subsistence strategy that we're most that we're all most familiar with and that's mechanized agriculture and so um, most modern countries practice this right this is where you grow your own food with the help of technology and so you have tractors and combines sometimes you have gmos sometimes you have chemical pesticides or fertilizers um, you have lots of processing of food um, that's kind of the world that, that we live in today, one of mechanized agriculture. So there's kind of five ways of, in general, of, of human beings getting their food. 
Um, but we're going to start out with foraging. Um, and the reason we start out with it is that's kind of our original subsistence strategy. Um, I know now we're living in now we're living in a world that is that feeds itself with mechanized agriculture, right? So we we grow lots of our own food and we use a lot of complicated technology to do it. Um, but for most of our history, uh, for almost three hundred thousand years, humans, Homo sapiens, were hunter and gatherers. We were we were foragers, and so hunting and gathering is what kind of built our body the way it is. Um, it influenced our physiology, so how our digestive system works. Um, all of those things were shaped by this subsistence strategy of, of hunting and gathering. Um, so as I mentioned, hunters uh, or foragers or hunter-gatherers, they gather their food from the natural world. They don't grow any of their own food. They don't keep any domestic animals, except for dogs, but they don't eat the dogs. Um, they collect things from nature. Um, if you looked throughout all of human history, you would probably find that humans have eaten just about every type of food that you could possibly imagine. Okay, so we've basically eaten every animal, every plant, um, insects, insect larva, aquatic animals, fruits, vegetables, um, tubers, nuts, seeds, roots, bark, leaves, everything. Um, human, humans have eaten everything that will not kill them. Um, but of course, it's important to remember that every culture has different rules about what should be eaten. And so in my, <clears throat> in my culture, for instance, we don't eat insects, right? We've been taught to believe that that is, that that is gross. Um, but there's nothing wrong with eating insects. Um, lots of humans do still eat insects and lots of e humans have eaten insects. Um, they're actually a very sustainable source of protein, by the way. Um, but um, we, we've eaten all kinds of foods. And so, um, but the food that a culture eats is going to be determined by what f things are available, where they live, and then cultural rules as well. And like I mentioned, every culture has food rules about what should be eaten and what shouldn't be eaten. Now, if we think back, it's very difficult to imagine, or it's very difficult to know for sure, what the lives of prehist <clears throat> excuse me, prehistoric foragers would have been like. Like I mentioned, there's no, <clears throat> there's no written records. People don't write anything down until maybe around five or 6,000 years ago. And so there's a 300,000 year period we have no writing and all we can rely on is archeology, span what we find left behind. But the problem with foragers, with hunter gatherers, is that they don't have a lot of stuff, okay? Um, as I'll talk about in a minute, hunter gatherers move around a lot. Um, they're constantly on the move. They probably walk 10 or 15 kilometers a day, every day. Um, and they're constantly moving around. And so you can imagine that if you had to carry everything you own with you every day for 10 or 15 kilometers, you wouldn't own a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> um, everything, you would look very closely at everything like Marie Kondo does and says, do I really need this? Um, and so, Hunter-gatherers don't have a lot of things. They really only have maybe their clothing, if they have any, the tools that they need to hunt with. And that's kind of it. That's kind of all they own. And so as a result, they don't really leave very much behind. There's not much to um, see in the archaeological record. And so in many cases, hunter-gatherers are kind of invisible in the archaeological record because they leave so little behind. Um, And then thirdly, there's not many people that hunt and gather today, okay? Most, most people have adopted different subsistence strategies in the modern world. And so we only have a few foragers left today to kind of study and compare. Um, but again, they've been interacting with agriculturalists and pastoralists for many years. And so 
their lifestyle isn't kind of a, in most cases, isn't a pure hunter-gatherer lifestyle um, anymore. So foragers use, foragers use um, their resources in a way that is extensive and temporary. And so what I mean by that is that I mentioned that foragers move around a lot, right? They're constantly on the move um, looking for food. And so what they'll often do is they'll come into a new area and they'll kind of just look for whatever's around, right? And so maybe they find some mushrooms and some nuts and maybe they have killed a rabbit or two um, and there's some berries over here and then that's what they'll eat. And so they'll stay there for a few days when it's kind of easy to find food and then after a few days they'll leave. And so their use of food is extensive and that they'll just kind of eat whatever's around but it's temporary in that they don't stay in the same place for very long and so they just kind of collect and eat the food that is easy to get and then they move on somewhere else okay they're constantly kind of on the move looking for whatever kind of food is around okay you can imagine these people as living in pretty small groups um, most hunter-gatherers live in groups of around 50 or so uh, and you would probably travel with this one group for most of your life and so there, there were really no strangers in hunter-gatherers because you're spending all day every day most of your life with this very small group of people and so hunter-gatherer groups are usually pretty tightly connected pretty tightly knit they're very cooperative um, and again, people knew each other very, very well. Um, often they move around in such small groups because they don't want to surpass the carrying capacity of the land. And now maybe I'll just kind of stop there. Does anyone know what carrying capacity is? It's kind of a biological term, which you may have heard before, but what do you think? Do you know what, does anyone want to take a make an attempt at what carrying capacity is. What is that? Do you know, do you know what that thing is? Uh, Karen says number of members to care for um, not quite but you're n you're not super far off you're you're right from a certain perspective that's not bad what else Does anyone want to take a take a swing at this one So it does have to do with the number of members of a group. Let's see, what do we think? Oh, sorry. Um, Eliana says number of people. Yeah, it has to do with the number of people. That is, that's part of it. That is part of it. Uh, how much people can it take? Maybe. What's it? What is it, Michael? What is what is it? Uh, Okay, maximum amount of people, the number of people, uh, there we go, that the environment can support, says Chris. The place, yeah, 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 good. I'm gonna put Chris's up there, but yeah, Michael, you're right too, and Karen and Eliana, you've got the other pieces. So yeah, carrying capacity is about how many people can be supported by the, yeah, by the natural environment, okay? And so 
because these people are relying on nature, because they're not growing their own food, nature only provides so much food, right? There's only so many mushrooms growing. There's only so many berries. There's only so many rabbits running in the woods. And so there's kind of a limit to the amount of food that's available in a certain place. And so if hunter-gatherer populations get too big, suddenly they're gonna start running out of food, right? So hunter-gatherers are very careful in terms of keeping their group size small. Um, I think we'll have time to talk about the fact that they try to keep their populations from growing as well. So they try not, women try not to have too many children. Um, and so as a result, um, these groups are able to stay below the carrying capacity. And so part of that is moving around in small groups. Um, yeah, that was good. Um, most people knew each other really well. As I say, they were living in groups of 50 and you would get to know everybody really well if you were doing that. Um, sometimes they may have been in conflict with other groups, other hunter-gatherer groups, but usually not. Um, you shouldn't think of these people as kind of warlike or prone to fighting. Um, it, it's so much easier for hunter-gatherers just to move and go somewhere else. And so you wouldn't often find them in conflict with each other. You would usually just find them moving and finding some other territory. Not always, but sometimes. Um, and sometimes groups would trade with each other, but they wouldn't trade food usually. They would kind of trade fancy stuff that you couldn't find everywhere. So shells or amber or pigments to sort of make paint or dye. That's the kind of things that they would trade with each other. Again, you should imagine a world where there are no permanent settlements, okay? So this is before this is before everything, right? If you think back, let's say we're let's say we're 20,000 years ago, okay? So think 20,000 years ago there are no villages, there's no roads, there's really no permanent settlements of any kind. Uh, and there's probably only about five to eight million humans on the entire planet. So there's not really many of us around. Um, here in Vancouver in the Lower Mainland, I think we've got about two and a half million people here. So basically double that. And that's the number of people maybe on the entire planet. So there's lots of room. There's lots of food resources for people. Um, and again, there's kind of no such thing as a lot of the things that we know. So no, no villages, no cities, no roads, none of that. Um, imagine kind of a pristine natural environment, if you will, for these humans to live in. Now, one of the things we should know about these people is that they were experts in their environment. So hunting and gathering isn't Hunting and gathering isn't a hard way to make a living. It's not a lot of work. And I know maybe I scared some of you off when I said they walked 10 or 15 kilometers a day, but it's not a lot of work, but it does require a lot of knowledge and skill. Um, it is not easy to know how to go out into the wilderness and survive with nothing, right? These people had to know everything. They, they needed to know how to make their own tools and make their own clothing how to find material for those tools and clothing. They had to know where to find food, what animals were around and how to trap them or how to hunt them, um, which plants you could eat, which plants would kill you, um, how to shelter themselves from the weather, whether it was really hot or dry or wet. Hunter-gatherers have a massive amount of skill and the area in which they live they know it like it's their own house. And so, again, we should think about these people as, you know, not wandering around desperate in search of food. We should look at these people as experts in their own environment. Um, they totally understand the environment they live in. They know all of the plants, all of the animals. They know how to predict the weather. They know how to survive. Um, and so they're highly, highly skilled people should also think about them in terms of their health. And basically from what we know about um, 
hunter-gatherers today, they were in excellent, excellent physical shape. And so they moved around a lot, right? Um, they were very active. They ate all kinds of different foods, and so they got lots of different nutrients. And so if you're thinking about hunter-gatherers and kind of what they were like, imagine a bunch of athletes, okay? Imagine a group of athletes living together, hunting and fishing. That's That should be your kind of general picture for these people because, again, when we look at their archaeological remains and even when we look at modern hunter-gatherers today, um, they are in excellent, excellent shape. Um, they get lots of nutrients, they get lots of activity, and they're really, really super healthy. Whew, okay. So, um, let me see, let me see. I think I'm going to stop it there because we've only got a few minutes left and it's been a lot of, been a lot of information today. Um, I will look at your um, culture meaning assignments later today that you sent me. Thank you very much for those. Um, if you didn't do it yet, you can still send it to me, but I think most people have. Um, I would like to do a quiz, and I know we've got one in social justice too, but I'd like to do a quiz on Friday. And I think in the syllabus I said we would do an oral quiz. And so how I imagine this working is that on Friday I'll go into Microsoft Teams, I will open up a little meeting, and then people will kind of come into the meeting one at a time. I'll ask you a question. You'll give me the best answer you can. So I'll say, tell me about this or tell me about that. You'll tell me as best you can. I'll give you a little mark and then you can go and then the next person comes in. I've never really done this before, but I think it'll work just fine. So keep in mind on Friday, you will have to be kind of dressed and presentable because I do want to actually see you in the video conference, okay? So keep that in mind. We'll do that on Friday. Um, we'll do that on Friday. Um, other than that, I think that might be all I have for today. Does anyone have any quick questions that they want to kind of ask while we're here and I can answer them or are we all good? What do you think? What do you think? No questions, says Cindy. By the way, whoever gave me the two thumbs up, I don't know if that's on my channel or on my video, whoever gave me those, thank you for that. I don't mind, I don't mind a thumbs up here and there. Um, okay, so Cindy's good. Who else? Uh, so the quiz will be about all of the classes. Yeah, I think I might, no, it's okay, all right. Uh, Aliana, I think we might cut it off maybe at the end of this human evolution thing. So nothing, nothing past today will be on that quiz. It'll just be from the first week and from yesterday, yesterday and today. Um, okay, so Michael's good. Okay, we're good. Got a thumbs up. Pearly's good. Woo, another thumbs up. Um, okay, well, as usual, I'll be, I'll be around in Microsoft Teams. If you need me, you can just send me a quick message and I'll answer you. That's no problem. Um, but other than that, I think I'll I'll sign off. Okay, so good work today. Look at all those thumbs up now. Woo! Uh, thank you for participating today. I appreciate that. It was nice to interact with all of you today. And um, yeah, ask me any questions if you want later. But other than that, I will see you. I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay, so take it easy.